Good evening. I kindly suggest you all to switch off your mobile telephones or use the mode, the silent mode. Dear brothers and sisters, I'm very glad to introduce to you Dr. James Tapfer. Dr. James Tapfer is a long-time student of theosophy and has been an associate of the United Lodge of Theosophists in Santa Barbara for many years, one of the Theosophical Institution's sisters. He received his doctorate in political philosophy from the University of California in Santa Barbara. Over the years, he has given numerous public presentations on Gandhi, most notably at the Institute of World Culture in Santa Barbara and at a recent International Theosophy Conference. He has also present Gandhian thought in a variety of college classes in philosophy, ethics, and world religions. He currently teaches introductory philosophy at Oxnard Community College in Southern California. Then I kindly invite Dr. James Tepfer to address you. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I will begin my talk by reading to you an invocation from the Rig Veda. And to end my talk, I will read to you an invocation from that noble Englishman, Shakespeare. But first, the Rig Veda. Common be your prayer. Common be your goal. Common be your purpose. Common be your deliberation. Common be your wishes, your hearts in concord, your intentions in concord. Perfect be the union among you. Let me begin this evening by honoring the ancient and noble practice of saluting those who have made this talk possible. I've drawn inspiration for Gandhi's connection with theosophy, principally from Gandhi's own writings and for Lewis Fisher's sparkling and insightful biography, The Life of Mahatma Gandhi. I've also immensely benefited from the brilliant and profound elucidation of Gandhian thought by Raghavan Iyer in his book, The Moral and Political Thought of Mahatma Gandhi. Lastly, I have drawn from a, from a variety of contemporary sources for meaningful pointers toward the emerging global civilization of the future. However, the richer, wider prospects and possibilities of the dawning Aquarian age have been nurtured by many seminal articles penned by H.P. Blavatsky, as well as by the mo that most powerful insightful of all books on the prospects of a universal civilization, Parapolitics Toward the City of Man by Raghavan Iyer as well. Now, before turning to the substance of my talk, I would like to add that it is especially a privilege to pre present this talk on the sacred soil of Aryavata, on the very site which was consecrated by the dynamic presence of that great and compassionate initiate, H.P. Blavatsky. It was H.P. Blavatsky, as we know, who made Adyar holy 
as she dedicated it to the global work of the spiritually wise and magnanimous brotherhood of bodhisattvas. And to its immense credit, the Theosophical Society, Arjā, has nobly weathered all the trials and tribulations of its past and might yet fulfill the prophetic declaration from the great master's letter that the Theosophical Society is to be the cornerstone of the religions of the future. Considering these profound facts, what more auspicious place to discuss Gandhi, Theosophy, and the global civilization than here in Agyar, at this gathering of students of Theosophia? Okay, about Gandhi. M.K. Gandhi was the most eminent social revolutionary of the 20th century and perhaps one of the many paradigms of the Aquarian man and woman of the coming centuries. Gandhi, as we know, was an unusual individual. He was not only a courageous man of action, but actually a deep thinker as well. As an earnest thinker, Gandhi was principled, lucid, and insightful. As a karma yogin, his actions were purposeful, purposeful and discriminating. As a bhakti yogin, he was a lover of God and man, and most especially a lover of God in man. Gandhi was honest to a fault, full of love for friends and strangers alike, and was blessed with abundant good humor. With respect to the latter quality, Gandhi was once asked by a British journalist if he had felt scantily dressed when meeting King George at Buckingham Palace. After all, persisted the journalist, Gandhi had only worn a dhoti and a shawl. Gandhi smiled and retorted, oh, not at all. His Majesty had enough clothes on for both of us. Gandhi could also take a joke at his own expense. Louis Fisher, his best biographer, visited Gandhi in 1942 and again in 1946. On his second visit, Gandhi humorously, humorously uh, re uh, remarked that Fisher must find him as unhandsome now as he had four years ago. Um, Fisher, with a twinkle in his eye, said, oh, I would never dare to disagree with a great man. So Gandhi laughed loudly and walked arm in arm with Fisher to his simple dwelling in the ashram. Now, beyond all these admirable traits, there was a deeper quality in Gandhi that is often overlooked, his desire to heal. Gandhi's fervent wish as a young man was not to be a lawyer or a social reformer or a national leader. His heart's wish was to be a doctor, a healer. However, he wasn't allowed to study medicine because of the practice of vivisection. Nonetheless, his compassionate healing impulse still found moments of spontaneous expression throughout his life. It led him to enter into forbidden areas of plague on at least two occasions in order to tend the desperate and the dying. He also voluntarily took into his home lepers and people with various maladies. He formed an ambulance corps during two wars in South Africa, and together with his ambulance crew, risked his life to, re to relieve the miseries of wounded soldiers on both sides of the battle. All in all, Gandhi's supple mind was obedient to his compassionate oceanic heart. This latter was, in fact, the source of his moral genius. Now, about Gandhi and theosophy. There was a golden current of theosophical influence that continually sustained the spiritual arc of Gandhi's life. That fertile current entered his life in November of 1889 at the age of 20 in London and continued as a vibrant, tempering influence until the day of his assassination in 1948. The seminal theosophical moment that occurred in London was when Gandhi met two theosophists 
who reintroduced him to the Bhagavad Gita, and most significantly took him to a meeting of the Blavatsky Lodge. There he met H.P. Blavatsky and Annie Besant. He had, by the way, read Annie Besant's book on why she became a theosophist, and he was very impressed by the reasons she gave for her conversion. As a result of Gandhi's personal encounter with H.P.U.B., as well as the encouragement of theosophical friends, Gandhi studied the key to theosophy. His study made him keenly aware of the philosophical richness and spiritual potency of Hinduism. It helped him to see through the many criticisms of Christian missionaries and eventually led him to declare that philosophical Hinduism was the religion that spoke to him the most deeply. We are told more about young Gandhi and his first encounter with theosophy from P. Nayar, Gandhi's personal secretary in his later years. Nayar tells us in his biography on Gandhi that, quote, he, Gandhi, read Madame Blavatsky's The Secret Doctrine, and on March 26, 1891, was enrolled as an associate member of the Blavatsky Lodge. The cumulative effect of Gandhi's fortuitous encounter with H.P. Blavatsky and his subsequent study of theosophical teachings is that it helped him to spiritually self-ignite. It kindled and fed what became an all-consuming flame of spiritual aspiration, an ardent search to experience God consciousness. Later, in South Africa, Gandhi continued his study of the Gita and of selected theosophical writings. In his private library in Durban could be found the works of whom? Of H.P. Blavatsky, who else? Of Leo Tolstoy and other eminent writers on, spi on spiritual ideas. Gandhi also had a deep interest in esoteric, esoteric Christianity as well as in Raja Yoga. In addition, he contributed to the activities of the Theosophical Society of Southern Africa, Johannesburg Lodge. While he apparently never became an official member of the Lodge, he did give a series of talks there on the major religions of India. Gandhi's personal association with Theosophists continued in India from 1915 until actually almost, in fact, up to the day of his death in 1948. He interacted frequently with theosophists in the pursuit of Indian independence and often collaborated with Sri B.P. Wadia, an eminent theosophist, an original co-worker of Annie Besant, and the founder of the first labor union in India. Furthermore, Gandhi freely acknowledged the historical fact that one of the co-founders of the Indian National Congress was a theosophist. He later repeated his recognition of Theosophy's seminal contribution to the Indian independence movement when he said, quote, in the beginning, the top Indian National Congress leaders were Theosophists. In a wider sense, we might say that Gandhi implicitly embraced the three objects of the Theosophical movement, but with specific reservations about the third object. As we know, the first object of the theosophical movement is to form the nucleus of a universal brotherhood of humanity without distinction of race, creed, sex, caste, or color. Gandhi's whole adult life could be seen as an attempt to embody the living spirit of this aim. It was the root inspiration of his fertile spiritual life and of his numerous experiments with truth. Brotherhood was also the universal constant in his solution to the complex algebra of the religious communal issues that plagued India and which the British government so cleverly exploited. As Indian independence neared in the late 1940s and violent disagreements intensified between Muslim and Hindu congressmen, 
Gandhi saw his hopes for a politically unified India wane. In an interview in June of 1946 with Louis Fisher, Gandhi lamented the patent smugness of many Hindus towards Muslim members of the Indian National Congress. He equally lamented the devolution of Muslim belief in the brotherhood of man into the brotherhood of Muslims only. In light of this sad dual realization, Gandhi made the following unequivocal declaration to Lewis Fisher. Quote, Theosophy is the teaching of Madame Blavatsky. Theosophy is the brotherhood of man. Gandhi was in effect making it clear that H.P. Blavatsky was the true teacher of theosophy and that its essential message of brotherhood was what Hindu and Muslim proponents were sorely lacking. In the end, the lack of brotherhood in the Indian National Congress led to the devastating division of a unified Aryavata into the separate nation states of Pakistan and India. The second object of the Theosophical Movement is to encourage the comparative study of ancient religions, philosophies, and sciences. Gandhi was a Hindu, initially by birth, but ultimately by choice. He was also an ardent student of the world's major religions. Since he came to recognize that each religious tradition embodies a profound set of spiritual truths, he declared that truth alone is God. This statement parallels the theosophical motto taken from the Maharaja of Benares. There is no religion higher than truth. It is not surprising then that since truth alone is God, Gandhi believed fundamentally in the following. Now listen carefully. Quote, I believe in the religion which transcends Hinduism, which changes one's very nature which binds one to the truth within and which continually purifies. The notion of an inborn transcendent religion rooted in nature was dialectically compatible with and supportive of a diversity of religious teachings. Like the full moon simultaneously mirrored in many different lakes, each authentic religious teaching relax, reflects some portion of absolute truth. This calls for more than mere tolerance. It calls for reverence of the world's multiple religious traditions. Such and, and, you know, and a willingness to search for underlying truths beneath constricting dogmas and rituals. It's really not surprising then that Gandhi admired the universal and universalizing spirit of theosophy. This appreciation was aptly and simply expressed in his foreword to the book, The Brotherhood of Religions, penned by the theosophist Sophia Wadia. In Gandhi's foreword to that book, he says, an understanding of and respect for the great faiths of the world is the very foundation of true theosophy. In this respect, <laughs> Gandhi also noted that true religion not only transcends all formal religions, including Hinduism, but also unifies them without destroying their fundamental discrete integrity. This dialectical outlook is compatible with true theosophia. The third object of the modern theosophical movement is to investigate the hidden laws of nature and the creative powers latent in man. Gandhi himself <laughs> recognized these subtler dimensions of nature and humanity. To quote from his autobiography, we are children of one and the same creator, and as such, the divine powers within us are infinite. So to Gandhi, mankind, men and women, 
have all the plethora of creative powers that exist in the divine. Now, to Gandhi, therefore, well, <laughs> the, um, the highest creative faculty, interestingly enough, in man was pure thought. And that faculty was regulated by the subtle and multi-layered law of karma. His belief in the karma generating power of thought sometimes created peculiar problems for him. Take, for example, his reaction to the Bihar earthquake of 1934. After the earthquake, Gandhi publicly commented that in his view, the earthquake was caused by what? It was caused by the sin of untouchability practiced by most caste Hindus. Well, as you might expect, many rationalists, scientists, and friends were thunderstruck and dismayed by this statement. So was Gandhi's close friend, Tagore. In fact, Tagore publicly chastised Gandhi and stated, quote, physical catastrophes have their inevitable and exclusive origin in certain combination of physical facts. Gandhi retorted to Tagore and to his critics alike. And Gandhi said, to me, the earthquake was no caprice of God, nor a result of the meeting of mere blind forces. We do not know all the laws of karma, nor their working. While Gandhi recognized the reality of occult powers, he felt that it was often an unhealthy diversion for mystics, for theosophists, for Hindus, to focus on hidden and as yet undeveloped psychic powers. Gandhi's concern, as we know, echoes a serious point made in the great master's letter in which the aim of universal brotherhood is fervently upheld and the fascination with occult powers strongly criticized. As the great master unequivocally states, quote, perish rather the theosophical society with both its hapless founders than that we should permit it to become no better than an academy of magic and a hall of occultism. In the last issue of Gandhi's journal, Harijan, ironically published on the very day of his assassination, Gandhi wrote the following. There are many admirable works in theosophical literature, which one, one may read with the greatest profit. But it appears to me that too much stress has been laid upon intellectual studies, upon the development of occult powers, and that the central idea of theosophy, the brotherhood of man and the moral growth of man, has been lost sight of. In the final analysis, Gandhi believed that the identity of all life with God and the derivative principle of brotherhood were the keys to the fullest possible life for all. This is certainly compatible with the presiding and moving spirit of Theosophia, our divine wisdom. But a final word before turning to the global civilization of tomorrow. What about Gandhi's inner voice? Like the Greek philosopher and revolutionary Socrates, Gandhi seems to have had an inner voice which guided him at certain critical points in his life. Unlike Socrates, whose inner voice prevented him from doing a particular thing, Gandhi's inner voice commanded him to do a particular thing. Gandhi claimed to have always followed the positive guidance he received. Now, how do we look at this? What framework of understanding do we adopt here? I think it is perfectly reasonable to regard Gandhi's inner voice as a higher bodhisattvic influence. If so, that further places him within the vast nourishing current of the theosophical movement. 
of the splendid and resplendent army of the voice. Now, we're going to look and talk about the global uh, civilization of tomorrow. But before doing that, I want to read you a quote from Gandhi that's apt. East and West are no more than names. Human beings are the same everywhere. He who wants to will conduct himself with decency. If we look into the future, is it not a heritage that we have to leave to posterity that all the different races commingle and produce a civilization that perhaps the world has not yet seen? Now, what Gandhi says could not only be, be true of India, which I personally revere, but true of my beloved America as well. It is my belief that America will in time grow into its noble vision and join hands across the great divide with Mother India. In so doing, they will bring together science and spirituality in such a unique way that it will give birth to a spiritual, intellectual, and social renaissance that the world has yet to witness. But I get ahead of myself. Let us turn toward the uncharted future, toward a possible global civilization of tomorrow. In doing so, we will humbly embrace Rilke's intriguing observation. What is that observation? It's very intriguing. Listen to what he says. The future enters into us in order to transform itself in us long before it happens. That's a very intriguing, puzzling statement. The future enters into us in order to transform itself in us long before it happens. In this sense, the global civilization of tomorrow is here now in embryonic form. Despite the confusion, greed, and violence so apparent in our tilting age of transition, there are nonetheless subtle signs of a dawning Aquarian awareness. The most significant one is a recognition that human and global interconnectedness is now undeniable. Culturally, economically, ecologically, intellectually, and in a thousand other ways, we are bound together in a common destiny. No man, no woman, no country, no religion, is an island unto itself. We are painfully inching our way toward a new kind of inclusive mentality, a new kind of global consciousness. If this is true, then what role might Gandhi's guiding principles, innovative reforms, and communal experiments play in helping to bring about, if not a global civilization, then at least a multitude of civilizing centers civilizing centers in which the initiative is on the side of inclusiveness, of universality, of generosity, cooperation, and trusteeship, rather than on the side of stultifying tribalism, insatiable greed, self-destructive competition, and cowardly coercion. In answer to that question, let us first recognize that Gandhi has already left his indelible imprint on generations yet to come. Look at what took place on the world stage in the years and decades immediately after his death. First, there was the pivotal incident that took place in India itself on April eight, uh, 18, 1951, almost 100 years to the day of the birth of that great theosophist, William Kwan Judge. On that day in 1951, Vinova Bhave, one of Gandhi's truest disciples, began the revolutionary Bhutan land, land reform movement. This reform movement, in my view, saved India from decades of violence and ideological conflict. This nation-altering movement originated in the following way. For some time, 
Bave have been mulling over the problem of what to do about the millions of landless peasants in India. The antiquated and unjust Zamindari feudal system was suffocating the landless. Furthermore, the most, and most significantly, the communists were fomenting violent revolution among the desperate peasants. There was chaos and mayhem throughout the major provinces of Telangana, then called Hyderabad state. To make matters worse, the new national government of India was struggling with a host of problems and had not yet found a solution to dismantling the Zamindari system or for coping with the fiery communist insurgents. Fortunately, Bave stepped into the epicenter of this dangerous situation and appealed to the wealthy landowners to voluntarily redistribute a small percentage of their land to the starving poor. At first, Bave's appeal fell on deaf, deaf, unsympathetic ears. But at the village of Punchampali, a landlord spontaneously stood up and offered 100 acres of his land to be allocated to 40 families in the village. Bave was delighted and intuitively saw this generous act as providential. The wealthy, this wealthy Zamandari had spontaneously brought together in his concrete gesture the Gandhian principles of trusteeship and non-coercive self-social transformation. The land gift movement called Budan had begun and would in time slowly sp spread across India. A few months after the start of the Budan movement, Prime Minister Nehru stood before the Indian parliament and made the following comment about Vinoba Bhave and his burgeoning land reform effort. Quote, this frail man has just accomplished solely by the force of nonviolence what all the military power of the Indian government would be unable to do. In the end, Bave collected and redistributed over four and one half million acres of arable land to the landless. And just as importantly, Bave and the gifts of the wealthy halted a teeming communist revolution. It was not minor, my friends. It was not minor at all. Turning to Gandhi's influence on America, we have the sterling example of Martin Luther King Jr., the Christian exponent of nonviolent social and racial reform. At a critical turning point in King's early life, he was encouraged by a remarkable mentor to read the writings of Gandhi, which he did. It was only then, he admitted, that he understood that it was possible to take the Christian principle of unconditional love and apply it to the social, economic, and racial problems of America. By the mid-1950s, King emerged as a leader of the American Civil Rights Movement and was responsible for initiating economic boycotts and civil disobedient campaigns across the racist South. His activities became a fundamental challenge to the conscience of America. During these creative and tumultuous times, King conceived a desire to travel to India. That wish finally came to fruition in 1959 when he made what he termed a pilgrimage to visit the land of his revolutionary mentor, Mahatma Gandhi. King's five-week pilgrimage to India had a profound influence on his understanding of nonviolent resistance and his commitment to America's struggle for civil rights. <clears throat> During his stay in India, King met with Prime Minister Nehru, with the reformed communist and socialist leader J.P. Narayan, with Vinoba Bhave, and most importantly, with hundreds of local Gandhians, social workers, and untouchables across the subcontinent. On his final evening in India, King made a moving radio address to the Indian people. In that eloquent address, he said, since being in India, 
I am more convinced than ever before that the method of nonviolent resistance is the most potent weapon available to oppress peoples in their struggle for justice and human dignity. In a real sense, Mahatma Gandhi embodied in his life certain universal principles that are inherent in the moral structure of the universe, and these principles are as inescapable as the law of gravitation. <laughs> King returned to America with a deeper understanding of the dynamics of nonviolent resistance and a tremendous appreciation for the Indian peoples and their ancient culture. Four years later, on July 2nd, 1964, the United States Congress enact, enacted the Civil Rights Act, which legally ended racial discrimination across America. This act, and the collective sacrifice that inspired it continues to sustain all concerted efforts toward American racial justice and equality. Turning now to Gandhi's influence in Europe, we have the nonviolent revolution that took place in former Czechoslovakia in 1989. This revolution of the Czech masses was called the Velvet Revolution. It spontaneously began on November 17th, 1989, exactly 114 years to the day of the founding of the Theosophical Society in New York City. It ended six weeks later. The intrepid nonviolent demonstrations and acts of civil obedience by the oppressed Czech peoples resulted in the peaceful abdication of the ruling Communist Party and the establishment of a, par a parliamentary Czech Republic. Four years later, in January of 1993, Czechoslovakia separated into two independent countries, the Czech and Slovak republics. It was a bloodless, nonviolent act of political division called the Velvet Divorce. It was bloodless, nonviolent, an act of political division, it was no less amazing than the nonviolent overthrow of communism four years earlier. There is now worldwide recognition that nonviolent non cooperation is a constructive form of social, political, and economic protest to correct perceived injustices. In fact, Nonviolence has entered into our very social and political vocabulary. This global fact is Gandhi's gift to our grandchildren's grandchildren. They will benefit. But the world still has much to learn from Gandhi, if it is to give birth to a universal civilization. The world's seminal thinkers and dedicated revolutionaries have yet to understand the signal importance of Gandhi's philosophical distinction between absolute and relative truth. Nor have many New Age thinkers and ecumenical devotees quite understood Gandhi's rich conception of the sacred. Nor have social historians ever understood or intuited the broader significance of Gandhi's ashram experiments. Nonetheless, all three are crucial, are critical to the human family if it is to pass through its current dark night of the soul, its nitya pralaya, the very painful, inevitable process of consciously dying into a new life. As pointed out in the moral and political thought of Mahatma Gandhi by Raghavan Iyer, Gandhi made a critical distinction between absolute and relative truth. We heard that yesterday wonderfully. A distinction which is the heartbeat of the first fundamental principle of the theosophical philosophy. Gandhi noted that absolute truth is ever beyond us, while relative truth functions as our immediate guide through the labyrinth of daily life. Sadly, Gandhi recognized that the failure of sincere religionists, ideologues, reformers, and rebels to clearly distinguish 
between absolute and relative truth in their own minds and hearts had created many of the world's tragedies. So many activists, observed Gandhi, fall prey to the tendency to absolutize the relative, to take an idea, an insight, or revered truth, and to treat it as final, as ultimate, as the only possible interpretation, as the only viable practical application. This mulish perversity spawns the world's political and religious isms and increases violence and divisiveness. It could well be that out of collective pain, disillusionment, and suffering, the men and women of tomorrow will gradually learn to honor the absolute in the relative by becoming humbler in the realm of self-assertion and claim-making. This sobering attitude will no doubt be aided by the progressive de-glamorization of all politics and religious power. Turning to Gandhi's notion of the sacred, Gandhi saw that not, that not only God is sacred and nature too, but humanity is likewise sacred. We, as human beings, are neither hopeless sinners, random cosmic accidents, bundles of instincts, nor sophisticated machines. No, we are essentially godlike and worthy of admiration when we act up to our moral, intellectual, and spiritual potential. Thus, in the not so distant future, the notion of the sacred will cease to be confined to conventional religions only, nor will it be limited to certain holy activities housed in enclosed spaces called temples, pagodas, churches, synagogues, or mosques. Nor will the sacred be viewed as something forever somber or grim, but as something joyous and elevating. On the whole, there will be such a pervasive feeling and reverence for life that men and women will learn to honor the hidden potency of the transcendent divine as it mirrors itself in everyday life. The most mature individuals in the centuries ahead will in inwardly salute the presence of the divine and the divinely human whenever and wherever they witness acts of authentic selflessness, of moral and spiritual courage, of spontaneous generosity, and of voluntary renunciation. Let us now turn to Gandhi's ashram experiments. Amidst the complex political challenges in South Africa and later in India, Gandhi realized that it was necessary to initiate a new kind of ashram, namely a micro community of committed individuals that deliberately brought together the spiritual and the social through the transfiguration, transfiguring power of vows. Vows of truth, non-violence, non-possessiveness, non-stealing, and the like. As a result of taking such vows, there was an active recognition and a place for divine, for diverse religions and religious teachings within the ashram. But Gandhi felt that spiritual vows and religious teachings are impotent unless they connect up with concrete social need. Therefore, Gandhi and his ashram co-leaders agreed to radically reconfigure Indian society within the parameters of their own miniature community. Over many years, they organically evolved a communal structure which eliminated caste differences, purged it of untouchability, reestablished the nobility of womanhood, honored the innate dignity of bread labor, and integrated the head, the heart, and the hand in the education of children and young adults alike. In the end, Gandhi's ashram experiments embodied, embodied a new kind of thinking, an original way of bringing together the seemingly separate worlds of religion and social reform by transforming both. 
His ashrams became the transformational levers or levers that realigned God within man, the sacred within the social, the citizen within the political community. Members of Gandhi's ashram in South Africa and India sought not moksha or nirvana or heaven, but rather dharma, skill in rendering intelligent service to the larger society and to the humankind as a whole. Relevant to this, it is rarely brought to the public's attention that there are at this moment literally thousands of eco-villages and intentional communities busily at work on every continent of the globe. These innovative communal experiments have become quiet centers of social, political, religious, and even intellectual pioneering. They are visionary, knowledge-based, as well as value-bound, and are refreshingly un 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 unpretentious. They are to be found where? Where do you find these intentional communities, these deliberate experiments in a new way of thinking, evolving a new kind of mentality and an outlook on the relationship of man to man and man to nature and man to God? Well, we find these uh, in inner cities, in suburbs, the countryside, in villages. Their historical roots are many, but they are, in some sense, subtly indebted to Gandhi's own bold ashram experiments of the last century. All that we have discussed so far points to the fact that the global civilization of tomorrow will call for a seismic shift in self-awareness, an inner transformation sparked and supported by innovative social and political arrangements at the micro level. As we have seen, this is already occurring in some fashion, but more is needed, especially at the psychological level. What is most needed in our time is not so much the sentimental yearning for a lost Satya Yuga, but more to the point we need to discover a lost self-confidence, individually and collectively. We need to arouse a deeper confidence in the potential of man to rise above the hell of self-will into the heaven of cooperative fellowship. How then do we ascend step by step <laughs> toward a more courageous and unshakable confidence in ourselves, in others, and in the uncircumscribed future? Gandhi's solution is simple, surprisingly, or seemingly paradoxical, and very challenging. He says that the fundamental cure for lack of self-confidence is moral and spiritual courage. Most of us, he states, are not as morally weak, intellectually confused, or as uncertain as we might think we are. Somewhere in our searching minds, we know what we ought to do. We know what is the decent thing to do, but we lack the courage or the verve to do it. In moments of quiet solitude, when we honestly scan our lives, we can clearly see that so many of our mistakes and tragedies could have been avoided with a little courage a little daring, a little caring, a little self-honesty, a little detachment from ourselves. If this is true, then what we need to do is to ignite our moral and spiritual courage by making a Promethean resolve to reduce our personalities to a zero in concrete moral situations. This unconditional resolve summons the heroic element in us. It awakens our innate determination to act rightly and honorably, without concern for consequences or, most importantly, concern for self-image. However, while this is the ideal, 
Gandhi was no romantic idealist, nor was he some foolish optimist, not at all. He was instead what is called an objective idealist. He understood that man and society are necessarily full of imperfections. It is part of the human condition that error, sin, and injustice shadow all human activities. So when our actions toward others fail to measure up to our ideals of truth and love, we must have the courage not to lie, not to temporize, or to rationalize our mistakes, either to ourselves or to others. We must correct ourselves before life does it for us. <laughs> Fortunately, Gandhi became a master of self-correction in every aspect of his life, from the personal to the political. On one occasion in South Africa, Gandhi and his wife, Kasturba, engaged in a heated argument over her doing scavenger work in the ashram. Eventually, Gandhi realized that he had lost his temper badly and was trying to force Kasturba to do something that was, as yet, completely unnatural to her. Gandhi felt badly and, overcoming his righteousness, said those magical words, I was wrong. He immediately followed this up with the potent mantra, I apologize. These acts of self-correction restored harmony between he and his noble companion and increased their mutual understanding and respect for each other. Gandhi carried over the principle of self-correction into that most difficult of all realms of social encounter, the political. In 1919, Gandhi in initiated a mass satyagraha campaign throughout India in response to the British government's oppressive Rolak Act. The British army responded to the nonviolent satyagraha campaign by brutally repressing protesters. Eventually, protesters, or at least some protesters, were unable to measure up to the high standard of nonviolent action and turned to violence and mayhem. Gandhi upon, soon realized his mistake and publicly declared that he had made a Himalayan miscalculation. He took personal responsibility for his mistake and called off the national campaign despite the heated disagreement of almost all his associates. Hardly a single companion, friend, thought that Gandhi should call off the <laughs> campaign which seemed to be so successful simply because there were a few acts of violence. But Gandhi had an amazing sterling sense of integrity, but he was not foolish either. He understood that in the long run and the long arc of working toward true, genuine progress, that India had to show something to itself and to the world, that it had the confidence, the sheer ability, the commitment to working through the problem in a way that was compatible with the dignity, the beauty, the magnificence of the Indian ideal which goes back thousands of years. Now, in both cases of deliberate and loving self-correction, we can see that Gandhi had the courage to set aside his ego. He was forced by the moral logic of his own vows to swallow his pride, his hurt feelings, his righteous anger, his high expectations, his deep disappointment, and perhaps even his self-image. He consciously chose to follow the moral, morally and psychologically demanding path of truth and nonviolence. In doing so, he purified his consciousness and paradoxically increased his confidence in his capacity to learn and to grow morally and spiritually. Clearly, the Gandhian template of selfless action and timely self-correction is vital if we wish to progress toward a better, more harmonious world. Now, 
It's important to note that self-renunciation is aided by two factors. Because Gandhi is about self-renunciation for the sake of a parapersonal, a larger cause. Well, what are these two factors? According to theosophy, Eastern philosophy, and modern cutting edge science, meditation together with con the conscious cultivation of universal responsibility are the keys to pos positively transfiguring, transforming, alchemizing the mind. Meditation is ultimately about self-gestation. It's about calmly negating the subtle tyranny of the lesser self and gradually ascending the ladder of consciousness into the imperium of the transcendent, all-compassionate one. Persistence in meditation and self-study helps us to progressively unself the mind, such that it becomes natural for us to generate expanding an expanding series of inclusive circles of responsibility for others, from one's family to one's community, and ultimately to the family of humankind. In light of this, we can actually understand why Gandhi was said by many to breathe compassion. One of the self-confessed constants of Gandhi's inner life was his daily meditation on the plight of the starving millions. This golden thread of lifelong meditation was the very heartbeat of Gandhi's rich and fruitful quest for universal brotherhood and God realization. Broadly speaking, as a spacious sense of self dawns upon human consciousness in the decades ahead, the king faculty of creative imagination will become a willing co-partner with impersonal reason. This happy alliance will make the personality of man more plastic, more capable of being self-shaped. This is, if this is true, there will come about a change in the valence of the mind. The mind will become more noetic, more suffused with luminous insights. In a word, the mind will become more multidimensional, incapable of inhabiting diverse perspectives and entertaining opposing points of view. Furthermore, man's empathic IQ will increase such that he will suffer and celebrate with others more easily. This new hospitable mentality is what is really at the heart of becoming more global. In this sense, one can live in a village and be global, or reside in a thriving metropolis and be parochial. It all depends on the quality of the individual state of consciousness, his pure or impure mentality. In summary, then, we might say that within the intentional micro-communities of the future that could well take place, the creative integration of the spiritual, the intellectual, and the social. If so, this could give birth to what we might call the magnanimous mind, the magnanimous mind, the dynamic fusion of the alpha intellect and the alpha heart. The magnanimous mind really points to a, how do we put it, a sublime ethical intelligence. This mind would reintegrate our mental, moral, and spiritual life. It would be truthful and compassionate, morally upright and tolerant, rationally exacting yet flexible and intuitive. At its best, <laughs> the magnanimous mind of tomorrow would be permeated 
with a felt sense of the sacred that expresses itself in boundless generosity and consummate grace. <clears throat> Such a spiritual mentality would evince a marvelous buddhic mobility. It would easily, or rather it would excel at shifting its focus from the theoretical to the practical, from the moral to the psychological, from prose to poetry, from the local to the global and back again. And what is more, this new kind of mentality would be as much at home in the spacious unknown as it would be in the formulated known. Because of the emergence of the magnanimous mind, the man and woman of the future will find it natural to be many things at once, a seeker of truth, a mystic, a lover of science, a, vi a viable contributor to the moral uplift of society, and a conscientious trustee of nature's resources. In essence, the man and woman of generations to come will, like Gandhi, learn to be spiritually independent, intellectually open, and socially responsible. They will withdraw all excessive allegiance to church and state, to sect and party, and by holding firmly to universal principles, regenerate civil communities within a multi-layered global civilization. Finally, the magnanimous mind, when nurtured within the numerous micro-communities of coming centuries, could well give birth to authentic islands of brotherhood that would grace the globe. Such iridescent centers of culture could summon to our rejuvenated earth jnanis from celestial spheres. These magus teachers would take birth once again and freely walk among men and women without fear of being hunted as devils or worshiped as gods. Such wise magicians of the heart would open wide the windows of perception so that the receptive and the distressed might equally catch a glimpse of the divine. They would reorient human consciousness toward a vibrant idealism and offer the alchemy of fresh hope to the ritualist, the materialist, and the spiritually downtrodden. If such exalted sages, if such magnanimous teachers were to incarnate and restore some form of Rama Rajya on earth, then we could all join in chorus with sweet, innocent Miranda in Shakespeare's Tempest when she joyously declares, oh, wonder. How many godly creatures are there here? How beauteous mankind is. Oh, brave new world that has such people in it. Thank you. I would like to thank very much Dr. James Tepfer for his talk, showing us interesting aspects of Gandhi's life, how theosophy influenced him, and his contribution for the global civilization of the future. Uh, yesterday, in the re-inauguration of Blavatsky Bangalore, some of us had the opportunity to see pictures where Gandhi was here with the other leaders, Rabindranath Tagore, uh, Annie Besant. They worked hard for the independence of India. And then they are uh, national heroes in this country. And then I would like to
thank you very much for your talk and the session is closed.